Hello, dear friends. Welcome to our live question and answers session with diplomat and political scientist Arab Papian. Our moderator today will be Sofia Badalian, who is a student at George Washington University. Hello, everyone. Hello. The first, the first most popular question uh, regarding ceasefire uh, signed on November 9th. So what kind of legal force does the statement carry? As a ceasefire, it's legal, but just to stop the war. But the rest, because there are a lot of other points included in that document, are illegal because the paragraphs that deals with interstate borders must be done by uh, interstate or international treaty. And the treaty, according to Armenian constitution and international law, must be approved in Armenian parliament, which never uh, was done. Uh, so we have a document which is called statement, ceasefire statement, but uh, it's much broader and from this point of view, it's an illegal. Just only one part uh, we can consider as legal one. Uh, Sophie? So regarding the ceasefire and um, its relation to the changing of the borders, how is that being implemented and enforced right now? As you said, it wasn't approved by the parliament, Armenian parliament. So how is that uh, taking place? It's uh, just forced upon Armenia, and unfortunately, we can see that our authorities did not take any steps against that, because we have at least a big question there. Can uh, Soviet uh, administrative borders be considered as international borders? Because here we have uh, one of the most important questions with, that we spoke about the, the question several times about the state succession of the modern Armenian state to the first republic, which means that we are successor to that republic and we have to clarify before that which borders are the state borders because the current borders that are considered by our government as interstate borders, they never have been because Soviet Union republics they were just administrative units within one state, but never subjects of international law. They did not possess any international personality, which is very important for that reason. Uh, we know that there are a lot of uh, international assessment about the status of Soviet Republic. Let's say there is uh, a law in the United States it's called uh, Law on Captive Nations, which clarifies that Armenia and other states were occupied, which means that the Soviet Armenia, according to international law, it was occupied territory, regardless how economically it was prosperous or not, how it was successful in culture or in many other fields. According to international law, it was occupied territory and so uh, the occupier, the Russia or at Moscow has no uh, right, had no right and has no right to define the border. So first must be defined uh, the succession of the statehood because we know that Azerbaijan, according to their first document, which is called uh, the, uh, uh, let's say first in Russian, then I will translate. Uh, it's called uh, Act of Vastanavlenie Gasudarsvinne Nizavismesti Azerbaijana. An act, a document of uh, uh, re, re, let's say, re, is stating the uh, independence of Azerbaijan Republic, which means they clearly uh, declare themselves as continuity of their first republic. And never uh, Nakhichevan and Karabakh, and when I say Karabakh, I mean much wider territory, bigger territory than Nagorno-Karabakh, 
They never were part of Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan never had uh, effective control over that territory. And possessing an effective control, it's an international uh, law term, is very important. And this was all also underlined in the League of Nations response to Azerbaijani application for becoming member of League of Nations. And this was the reason why they were rejected. So based on the League of Nations, um, what were the borders recognized by the League of Nations for Armenia a uh, hundred years ago? Uh, you know that after World War I in Paris, Paris Peace Conference was held. Uh, it took uh, from 1919 up to 1920, from January to January. And the fate and future of uh, German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Bulgaria was decided within that year. After that, in January and in February 1920, they dealt with the issue of uh, Ottoman Empire. And uh, this issue had two parts. One was the border between the Republic of Armenia and Turkey. Uh, we know that it was defined by arbitral award done by Woodrow Wilson on November 22, 1920. And there was another decision by League of Nations which defined the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Georgia. Um, a special commission was put together uh, and it uh, consists of uh, the members of Council of the League of Nations, the highest body of League of Nations, uh, British Empire, France, uh, uh, Italy and Japan. And this special commission uh, issued uh, uh, a special, it called uh, proposals, uh, suggestion and proposals, uh, report and proposals, sorry, record, uh, report and proposals on the borders of Armenia. And according this document, which means this is the highest document that ever exists in international law about the borders, because League of Nations Council was the highest body, not only Nagorno-Karabakh, also let's say the no, let's say not only Upper Karabakh, not all, but also Lower Karabakh were part of the Republic of Armenia, as well the Nakhichevan was part of Armenia because Nakhichevan at that time was part uh, of uh, Yerevan Gubernia, mainly Yerevan Gubernia. So the border is uh, much easter than uh, the border of the Soviet uh, Armenia, which includes, uh, let's say, uh, if we recognize or accept this so-called the Republic of Artsakh, all that territory even more in the north and northeast part, which we call historically Gardman or Lower Karabakh. So regarding the, the Treaty of Sever that you just mentioned and Woodrow Wilson's arbitral award, um, do these uh, borders, could they possibly still apply? Are they still valid legally? Yes, legally they are valid because the basis for Treaty of Sever and especially for arbitral award are the same as were for the other countries in Eastern Europe and in Middle East. If we regard them as uh, unlawful, what will be the basis for Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, and so on? Because all these issues were decided either in the other peace treaties or in several peace treaties regarding uh, Ottoman Empire. And uh, it was done in San Remo conference, which uh, was held uh, from uh, April 23 up to uh, April 26 in San Remo city of Italy. And the basis for all Middle Eastern uh, countries were defined at that time. As well, the mandates were given to the 
several states. You know, um, France got some of them uh, over modern territory of Syria and Kilikia as well. Uh, uh, British Empire got over uh, Transjordania, which at that time and Palestine. And uh, United States got uh, the mandate of it was proposed the mandate for Armenia, which unfortunately was rejected by um, Congress on June 1st, 1920. But regardless of the voting, the uh, status of the mandate and the territories still remain as legal because uh, when the Senate took this issue in her agenda and discussed this, this means they accepted that the territory was at that time, at that moment, not uh, part of Ottoman Empire. Because according Article 22 uh, League of Nations Charter, only on the former territories of Ottoman Empire, the mandate can uh, be given, which was uh, given to the United States, as I told in April, which means at least from April uh, afterwards, um, Ottomans or Turks did not possess any rights to that territory. And later on, based on San Remo suggestions, uh, on May 11, the draft of peace treaty was given to the Ottomans. And then on August 10, the treaty was signed. I would like to mention that before that, before signing the treaty, Ottomans uh, approved that. They held special meeting uh, with 72 generals, senators, and uh, other notables. Uh, and according to uh, Ottoman constitution, even Sultan, just as a person, had uh, the right uh, alone to act on behalf of his country. But he held at that time uh, sp this special meeting, and the approval was given. This is because some people are saying that uh, Turkey never uh, accepted Treaty of Sever. They accepted this. And regardless of this situation, uh, Woodrow Wilson's arbitral award was signed and sealed by the Great of Seal of the United States on November 22, which means that regardless the status of Treaty of Sever, the uh, arbitration is in force uh, until now. Also, I would like to uh, remind that in 1927, a treaty that was signed on August uh, 6, 1924, so-called uh, the Smaller Lausanne Treaty. Um, it, it was a treaty between the United States and Turkey, not the, the other Lausanne Treaty that we call bigger laws and treaty that we know generally. This is a separate one, just bilateral, uh, to uh, renew uh, the, um, the uh, uh, diplomatic relations between Ottomans uh, or Turkey and the new United States. And it was voted down by the uh, by Senate in 1927. And the main reason was that the arbitration is in force and until the arbitration can, uh, uh, until the arbitration will be applied or fulfilled or implemented, uh, any other treaty cannot be ratified with Turkey. So uh, the diplomatic relations between Turkey and uh, United States they exist. They exist from 1928, but they do not have any legal basis for that, because the basis was rejected by Senate. Uh, Mr. Fabian, I just want to get back to the previous question. So in fact, in 1920s, uh, Armenia, uh, either Azerbaijan, were occupied by Soviet army troops, like uh, by Bolsheviks, right? So the two kind of republics already not existing, republics after occupation, they had uh, territorial divides between them, right? Some uh, territories were took and gives uh, to another party. So actually 
what kind of documents under those treatments considering legally this process? Is there any kind of legal document uh, uh, under this process which is making the, the, the point to insist that this, those territories is belong to this country or that country? I already told that uh, legally speaking, only there is one international document. This is the report and proposals of League of Nations dated uh, February 24, 1920. Uh, but uh, de facto on the ground, actually the uh, territory of Nagorno-Karabakh was given to Azerbaijan or to Azerbaijani administrative control by just only party decision, Kav Bureau, Bureau of Caucasus of Russian Communist or Bolshevik Party, which is uh, illegal and was illegal at that time. Even according to Soviet constitution at that time, uh, Russian constitution, uh, uh, the real power belonged to Soviets, not to party. Party was some kind of uh, organization, and it later it gained the real power. I mean, uh, Kav Bureau decision was illegal at that time from domestic law point of view and from international point of view. Uh, also, I already told that Azerbaijan, by the, their first uh, uh, document, they rejected the Soviet heritage, uh, saying that it was officially by parliament that it was period of occupation by Russians of Azerbaijan. And if it occupied, they cannot apply to any document of an occupier to base on that their rights. It's uh, illogic to do. But uh, you see, when they want to use Soviet heritage, they uh, use uh, the Soviet documents. When they want, they uh, just reject them. But uh, re regardless all of these uh, facts, the like united, yeah, like, let's say the war, civil war, they considered that those parts, they are Azerbaijani parts, regarding what kind of statement, what kind of documents they, uh, they made this statement. Uh, you see, this is uh, the result of very uh, good job, continuous job of Azerbaijan and Turkey. They have uh, that kind of views that uh, Karabakh belongs to Azerbaijan. They are political statements, not legal. And my suggestion always was that we have to apply to international court to identify the documents and having some kind of decision, either having either maybe advisory opinion from international court, we could easily refer to that saying, you see, uh, there are no documents. Unfortunately, uh, these claims never were properly answered by Armenian government. Uh, there is a, a very uh, used so-called uh, argument by Azerbaijan that uh, the borders of Azerbaijan were recognized by United Nations. Uh, United Nations has no right or legal uh, opportunity to recognize any borders. They just uh, accept the states if they want to become members to the United Nations, already recognized states. The borders of any state uh, are, are recognized by the neighboring countries by a special treaty or if there is a special uh, uh, body that has the, that rights. Let's say when I spoke about special commission of League of Nations uh, to decide Armenian borders of the Republic of Armenia, it was special commission that was put together to do that job, that task. It was tasked to do that. Otherwise, no international body has the right to define the borders. Let's say Russia recognized uh, Azerbaijan as an independent state in December 1991. The borders between Azerbaijan and Russian Federation was recognized by a special treaty between these two countries in 2010. 
So uh, if there is no special agreement or treaty on borders, there, there is no, legally speaking, there is no border between that countries. Uh, Sophie? So um, regarding what you've been saying, uh, how legitimate have Nikol Pashinyan's actions been as the head of state so far regarding the document and the border issues and the validity of the Treaty of Sever? One of the um, watchers is asking, what are Armenians doing now regarding the treaty? What is uh, uh, Pashinyan's role in this? Unfortunately, uh, Pashinyan and his cabinet is doing nothing as the previous ones. The, the only time that Armenian government uh, officially spoke about uh, Armenian rights and uh, Wilson's uh, arbitration was in January 2015 in joint declaration, which was issued uh, in Citerna Kabert. Uh, with participation of a lot of Armenian organizations from diaspora parties uh, to Catholicos uh, and the others as Armenian government as well. And at that time, there, were, there was taken a decision to put together a special working group to prepare that big file, the documents that can be used in future, which is now actually, uh, to use that uh, file uh, for filing uh, claims uh, or complaints against Azerbaijan or Turkey. Unfortunately, this was never done. And uh, uh, this creates or maybe uh, may creating a problem for Armenia because uh, in international law, there is an understanding of estopel. Estopel means that when you uh, do, not, uh, do not use your rights, you can lose the rights. Let's say use it or lose it. This kind of understanding. Uh, they will, uh, let's say, it's quite probable that when we apply the uh, Court of International Law, uh, uh, it, uh, the, which we usually call the uh, Court of United Nations, uh, they will uh, not accept maybe the application saying that Armenia was an independent state for 30 years or 40 years. Uh, and during this period, never took any step. And uh, with not taking any steps, uh, they agreed with the situation. This is very dangerous. The, everybody remembers that uh, Aliyev always was speaking that uh, there is a issue of Nagorno-Karabakh and it's not sold. Uh, and from time to time, he was uh, uh, provoking some uh, smaller wars or uh, military conflicts on the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan because of that. He wanted to show that there is no estopel on this question because Azerbaijan with her actions and words didn't agree with the situation. Unfortunately, this silence from Armenian government and taking no action can be used against uh, our rights and claims in future in the court. And Mr. Papian, obviously there is uh, like uh, sufficient of facts and legal ways to get the problem solved using the like uh, legal actions uh, uh, like lawsuits without any war. But in fact, Armenian government never did any action. What's the problem? I mean, it's obvious you could do the job without having any losses, any war, you know, any economic, any physical losses to avoid the war, to solve the problem in a very nice way. What was the problem? I mean, what was the issue to not doing anything? Is there any I cannot. I cannot answer to that question because I don't know the answer. Uh, several times I asked this question to Armin authorities saying, why you do not take any action? Because let's say uh, to the whole action, which we will be divided into three parts. The first step, let's say it's gathering the documents, information, 
analyzing the second one is legal assessment and preparing the court case and the third one going to court. All will take four or five years and totally, including the court process, four or five million dollars, which is nothing for uh, even uh, for Armenian state to uh, one million per year. But it never was done and I never got any explanation because some were non-officially telling uh, me that, oh, oh, okay, if we lose this, uh, how we will deal with, first of all, if we'll prepare our claims, it's really very solid, uh, has very solid base. But the us is also that taking a, an action always is very important because, uh, okay, if we'll not get fully satisfied, at least we can have some other satisfaction, let's say uh, opening the borders or the cultural heritage on our territories or ex-territorial investment, right? And so on, it's possible. I, I, in my concept of the solution of Armenian question, I have written all these intermediate steps that possible to, to get, because we have to understand that uh, not only changing the title of the, the territory, which is the final step, it can have several pre steps till that, a precursor to the final solution, which uh, will be very important for Armenia. Uh, let's say now uh, Armenian government is uh, speaking uh, about opening the border with Turkey, I myself against of that because it will not uh, give new opportunities for Armenia, but it will challenge our economy from Turkey's side. But anyway, if they want to do open that, it's much easier to do through international law and force them to do because if it will be open by Turkish will, they uh, from uh, their side they can easily find any kind of excuse and close the border anytime when they uh, want to do that. Uh, Mr. Papian, uh, doing nothing uh, by Armenian, uh, Armenian government is assumed that the reason they didn't pursue national interests, maybe just because of interest of some other countries. We all, every, like, we all know that Armenian government never was uh, independent. They were always put it by Russian's government. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the process if uh, occurred before it will touch interest of Russia, maybe Turkey, maybe some other countries, because they might, they might be any uh, explanation, which is not obvious maybe for us, but there is definitely some explanation, right? There's at least reason, hidden reason. What can be? What kind of interest? What kind of uh, countries have in, in, in interest in these actions? Uh, you see, it quite probable that uh, Armenia, uh, Armenian authorities uh, have concerns that Russian government will be uh, not very positive towards that kind of uh, issues because. You see, we have to speak about Russian occupation of Armenia in 1920 mm -hmm. by Bolshevik Russian army. Uh, but which, by the way, was done by uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan, and they survived that, especially Azerbaijan, saying that uh, the, twice, at least twice, Azerbaijan was occupied by Russians. First, in 1813 under uh, Kulestan Treaty, and the second time in uh, 1920 by Bolshevik army. And we see that they have a better relationship with Russians than we. And this uh, shows that um, it's not the reason that we can lose some better, better relations with uh, Russia. It's based on some other things. Uh, by the way, I met a very high official, uh, Russian high official in November yeah, last year and told about arbitration and about legal succession of the Republic, uh, modern Republic to the First Republic and Russian occupation and Stalin and Bolshevik, uh, let's say, misdeeds, wrongs, and even crimes against Armenians. 
He said to me, you are, you are right, but you have to understand that in Russia now, pro-Stalin forces are getting power, and it's not the right time to speak about against, or let's say, Bolsheviks and Bolshevik occupation, because the time has been changed. During Yeltsin, it was uh, much easier to do, and Georgia and Azerbaijan did, but now we see that, according to Putin himself, uh, that Soviet Union uh, or dissolution of Soviet Union was the biggest catastrophe of 20th century. And uh, he is trying to rebuild Soviet Union from scratches. And this uh, very active, or I will say even aggressive policy to South Caucasus also based on rebuilding of uh, Soviet uh, Union, or as they said, what they want to, to do is this some kind of 19th century approach to modern policy. Now, the other empires, let's say British Empire or France, they also were big empires, uh, which was not so bright, also had a lot of black pages, but they overcame already this heritage. Uh, they uh, sometimes they uh, also uh, uh, gave political, uh, historical, uh, even legal assessment to that the uh, periods. But in Russian, uh, in Russia, we see glorification of Russian imperialism. This is very dangerous. Okay. Speaking to this point that you just brought up about Russian imperialism and. I think a lot of Armenians have a question as to why Russia wants to stay so involved in the region. It just um, uh, continues to reinforce the self-prescribed regional um, uh, regional uh, status quo. Do you think this is just a continuation of um, the Russian imperialist idea and just uh, kind of the continuation of keeping influence in the region? Or are there any other uh, reasons that Russia could be so interested in keeping control of this territory, of this area, and of Armenia in general? I think that uh, Russia, and uh, they spoke about this several times officially, see the West as the main enemy for them. And let's say Peskov, spokesperson for Putin, told that we have less disagreements with Turkey than with West. And they do understand they do not have enough economic or military power to uh, counterbalance Western influence on Russia. And this is now that they see themselves rejected by West. Turkey as well has complications in her relationship with West. And these two countries, they are coming together and they want to create some kind of synergy, uh, Turkish, uh, Russian, uh, we call it uh, union or some kind of uh, alliance or something like that against West. And uh, in this situation, Armenia that usually we consider as an ally to Russia becomes obstacle for Russia. As it was in 1920, the same situation. We can see the, uh, that it repeats herself the situation that Armenia was uh, fighting for Russia and Armenians who were fighting for Russia. And Armenia, the First Republic, was the only country in South Caucasus which was faithful to Russians until the end, fighting in Baku before that in Sardarabad and so on. But when the uh, Bolshevik revolution happened and the idea was changed that now it's the time of world revolution and it could be done through Muslim world's, uh, world, it shows that at that time they had to change uh, it, their general policy. Uh, and Armenia, as I told, became an obstacle and they wanted to go to and uh, implement world revolution by Turks. The same situation we can see now that uh, they see Armenia as an obstacle and see uh, Karabakh as just a small military base for them. 
and now they are trying to please uh, Turks in all ways that is po possible. And also we can see that Turkey bribes Russia. Uh, just I read today an information that Turkey will buy 30% more natural gas from Russia. And also uh, we see that uh, Azerbaijan now exports oil not via uh, the famous Baku Jehan pipeline, but Baku Novorossiysk, which means all this gave Russia as a state hundreds of millions of dollar profit, as well the uh, Russian officials who are meanwhile the oligarchs, they are getting hundreds of millions of dollars in their pocket. Because we know that uh, Russian uh, uh, main article of the experts is gas and oil. And they are doing also this for Azerbaijani and uh, ha having more, more money. Just this also, it's a simple bribe for Russians, let's say. Uh, Mr. Papia, let's put aside all vocabulary like uh, political and diplomatic vocabulary. Let's speak honest. What, what was the point of this war? This Was it only for these pipes? Like, it, is it too simple to take this point of view that entire this war was just because of these pipes? Because in this war against Armenia, where it involved the countries as a, let's say, even like Israel, like Ukraine, like uh, Belarus, Russia, they all sold a uh, weapon and Turkey, Russia. I mean, all of the countries was, were involved in this uh, war against small Armenia. What for? Exactly what was the point? What was the goal? I don't believe that uh, everything's happened just because of these pipes making, uh, uh, make like uh, war these pipes having a couple millions more. I guess there was uh, the higher Goal put it. Uh, sure, uh, such events as wars, they are very complicated uh, e events and they have uh, several components. That, that I mentioned about its pipelines, these are an auxiliary outcomes of the war, not the main one. The main mm -hmm. one was, I think, to have a closer Russian Turkish relationship, to gain. Uh, uh, land connection with Turkey, as was in 1920, when we read the agreements, let's say an agreement that was signed in Tbilis on August 10, 1920, between the Republic of Armenia and Russian Federation at that time, the main idea was to gain a land uh, road uh, to and a land connection to Turkey. At that time, the idea was for world revolution, no, they have the same, but the idea is to have this synergy, Turkish-Russian synergy, because Russia clearly understands that uh, he, she is in retreat. And for Russian Russians, from their point of view, it's better to give South Caucasus to Turks, not, let's say, to French. As Peskov clearly said, it's better to give uh, the South Caucasus to, to, to Turkey, otherwise uh, they uh, Americans or French will come. They are speaking clearly. It's in their interest. But from our point of view, Armenian point of view, we do not want to be under Turkish control. This is the case. When some people say that you speak about Russians, no, we do not speak about Russians. We speak about the situation that exists and Russia is selling out our interests and our country and our people. And uh, Russia will give up South Caucasus. Will be in three years, five years, 10 years, but they will, they do not have enough power to keep that region. But they want to gain other interests. Let's say it's very dangerous for us also the situation because we have to look uh, wider. The situation in uh, Crimea or in Syria or in Libya because Russian-Turkish relationship, it's uh, some kind of 
love and hate relations that um, let's say to gain more uh, control in Syria or uh, less confrontation with Turkey in uh, Crimea, Russia can easily agree with Turkey to give Armenia for them for three years, as usually they will be late for uh, days, sorry. They will be late for three or five days and uh, Turks will complete the uh, their dream destroying Armenia. Okay, at that time they, they will come people and they will blame me, yourself and others saying, you see, you spoke against Russians and because of that Russians did not protect us. No, they do not want to protect us and they will find lots of excuses to do this because it's not in their interest to fight Turks, to confront Turks. It's not in the, it's not in the economic or military from military point of view, Russia today is weaker in South Caucasus than Turkey. In, I, I would like to underline in South Caucasus. Maybe in other parts, uh, let's say in Pacific Ocean, and so it's uh, stronger. But in South Caucasus and in Black Sea, Russia is weaker, and they will not go to any military confrontation with uh, Turkey because of Armenians. And the only uh, way, only solution for us to find an alternative ally for, for us, uh, which country has economic and military power to do this? I mean, to take under her umbrella the region, including Armenia, there is only one country, United States. Will they have a political will to do so? I'm not sure, but we have to work on this direction. Otherwise, we'll be totally destroyed. And when I'm saying destroyed, it does not mean in general words. It's, I mean, in real uh, destruction of the country with bombardment, with military invasion. When we are speaking about this uh, regarding Karabakh, everybody was saying it is impossible because Russia is backing us. We saw that. Who is backing whom? Uh, and Russia was the main supplier for weapons uh, to Azerbaijan. The same situation we now see in uh, Sunik, in that part of Armenia, in the southeastern part of Armenia, which is one of the most important parts of, of Armenia. And the next goal of Turks, and saying Turks, I mean Turks from Turkey and uh, from Azerbaijan, is to gain wider connection with uh, other parts uh, of Turkey. And um, I uh, was listening an interview by Lavrov, Foreign Affairs Ministry, uh, Minister of Russia, some two days ago. And he was totally in denial of these plans of Turkey, of pan turanic pan turkey and saying, and it was clear that he is just afraid to accept this, because if he will accept, there is there are some not only ideas but also programs. They have to act, but how they can act? They cannot because alone they can't. They have to become closer with West, but they hate West, and this uh, is uh, irrational uh, hating hate for for them. And because of that, they ca cannot. Uh, um, uh, they, they, they cannot have a real policy in the South Caucasus uh, fighting back Turks economically or militarily. I guess they could uh, stand against this program just simply to not betray Armenia, to not, not let alone Armenia and not help the enemies of Armenia and uh, uh, in, in the reality of Russia. Because all those mercenaries that stayed in Azerbaijan they will let them know why they stay there very soon, I believe, because uh, Turkey never will stop with their idea. It, it, either Lavrov believes uh, regarding or afraid is, is not making any difference. They will do that and will, they could stop the process only just not betraying Armenia and not leaving alone against all of these uh, military forces. And, 
not only uh, they were uh, supporting, 86% of Azerbaijani army uh, was uh, Russian weapons. They sold over $5 billion weapons to Azerbaijan. So, uh, Sofia, welcome. Um, so, I think many people ask, uh, ask how uh, Russia may have acted differently in moderating this uh, ceasefire and this document had the United States or the European Union or NATO shown greater interest in moderating the conflict. But do you suppose that maybe the key determinants in this conflict were not with the moderators or with Russia, but more between Armenia and Azerbaijan themselves, considering they haven't had any diplomatic relations or any dialogue for the last 25 years. And based on what you were saying just now about how uh, Russian capacity to keep control of the South Caucasus is dwindling, and you say in the in the next couple few years that that may uh, fall fall uh, fall basically. Um, do you think that Armenia and Azerbaijan, if they restore relations and uh, somehow uh, find a way to pr broker this this situation and fix this conflict without Russian intervention at all. Do you think that could be a way to remove them from the region and kind of take back control of the situation? And obviously now that this situation has escalated to the point of war, um, but had they avoided that in the beginning, do you think that would have been a way to um, distance uh, Russian uh, uh, involvement uh, first of all i do not think that it was and it is possible directly to negotiate with azerbaijan because their demands are so illogical and are so high even now after the war they speak about liberation of uh, gokcha zangezur and Irivan, and on the highest level uh, Oh, well, the president is speaking about this and several times. Also, uh, Azerbaijan never was alone. Uh, Turkey was at least at least behind Azerbaijan always, especially these uh, last ten years, supplying with modern ammunition, with these famous drones and so on. Uh, we know that the whole war, the operations were uh, overseen by uh, Turkish commanders, generals, not Azeris. And to Turkish intelligence services were used for that. Their special aircrafts uh, were used so on, which means that if we, the problem was that uh, Azerbaijan with, was with Turkey, in part was with uh, Pakistan, and some mercenaries from Syria, Armenia was totally alone because Armenia was hoping that Russia will support because we are ally of Russia. And because of that, many, many times we voted in the United Nations uh, for Russians. Uh, and because of that, uh, lost a lot of uh, economic support from Western countries because we were just among Vietnam, Cuba, Venezuela, Vanauto, and so on. But uh, Russia never appreciated the Armenian approach. They are always not satisfied by Armenian situation or situation in Armenia. They always themselves create our enemies within Armenia let's say, saying that Soros is doing all this. They know that uh, this is, a, sorry, a bullshit. But they want to find an excuse to approve why they are not doing, saying, you see, you are, you did not agree that uh, Russian language will become second language in Armenia. And because of this, uh, we are punishing you. Why Russian will uh, become second language in Armenia? There are only a handful of Russians living in Armenia, and so on. Uh, when you want not to help your uh, ally, you will find all these excuses, which Russia is doing. 
the main basis for such approach is uh, that one time uh, Yeltsin, former president, said that Akudani Zenutsa, Armenians has no exit, no way to go. This is their approach. This is why I am always speaking, creating better relations with West. If Russians will know that we have some other uh, possibilities, their approach will be changed. I mean, uh, improving the relations with the West will give uh, the basis for improving the relations with Russia. Russia will change her approach towards Armenia. This is very important part. Sp uh, speaking about improvement the relations with, let's say, United States, I am speaking for better relations with Russia because only in that case Russia will uh, appreciate Armenian value Armenia because they will see that Armenia has another place to go. Not saying that Armenia has no other uh, choice because this situation, even if we agree with losing Karabakh and so on, it will not stop on this stage. We can see clearly maximum this situation can be continued for five years maximum can be and russians have to take a decision stay or go and also we do not know what kind of uh, deals will come with uh, between russians and turks and uh, i already told that the deals not only regarding south caucasus but also other parts of the world where they have Russians and Turks have involvement in that part of the world. And we do not have more information to understand what is going on. But we are in very vulnerable situation because of that. Okay. Before, before moving on to um, another question, I want to bring up something that one of the viewers had asked in the chat was um, regarding uh, diplomatic relations with Azerbaijan. What steps do Armenians expect from the Azerbaijani government in order to restore the relationship? Is it possible um, in the near future or in the future at all? What, are, what is your opinion on that? First, we have to clarify what does mean uh, restore relationship because we did not have relations uh, since 1920. So, I mean, occupation of Azerbaijan and Armenia by Russians. Secondly, okay, during uh, first republics, we had diplomatic relationship. We had even ambassadors uh, accredited in the capital cities, but it does not uh, prevent, uh, did not prevent the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan is some kind of misunderstanding, misinterpretation of the situation that if uh, countries will recognize each other, the mutual recognition will avoid the war. No, we have seen that Turkey invaded Syria and they have diplomatic relations. Iraq invaded Kuwait and occupied Kuwait. It's, uh, it's uh, just, a fact that country was recognized by another country does not mean that it will stop a, an occupier to, to go ahead. The, the main, uh, let's say, basis for the peace is to have strong economy, strong country, and strong war. But until we are under Russian control, we will not have any economic, effective economy in Armenia because the high corruption that exists in Russia and Armenia is a province of Russia. And usually in the provinces, we can see that it's aggravated and the, the, the corruption is very high. One of the reasons that we lost the war in Karabakh, it was the corruption in Karzakh. And when we were speaking about the corruption, about misuse uh, of the, 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 the positions of authorities, uh, Armenian diaspora and many in Armenia were saying, no, uh, you can say only positive things about Artsakh. And because of that approach, we lost the war because uh, diaspora usually speaks about the donations that diaspora was giving to Artsakh, and we are thankful for that. 
it was around 10, 12 million dollars per year. But nobody speaks about Armenia and the citizens of the Republic of Armenia that was giving directly 100 million, at least 100 million dollars directly as uh, to the government and other 400 million to Karabakh army. Armenia was giving half a billion dollar each year to Nagorno-Karabakh. And they wanted to keep so-called independence of uh, Artsakh because it gave them just to stole the money, to pocket the money and no control. Receiving the money without control. And among that, if they were stalling money of the that 500 million, what is 10 million of diaspora not to be stolen? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Papian, uh, as we see, the story is repeating. I mean, there is nothing new. It's happened before. It's going to be happen in future if we will not change our behavior. How could Armenian government uh, rely on Russia, seeing always the same way of treatment, same behavior? How they could rely on that? Uh, you see, uh, the problem is that if you want to keep the power in Armenia or become the government of Armenia, you need Russian support. Russia is very strong in Armenia with her agent, people of influence, Russian TVs, and the first language for many Armenians until now in Armenia is Russia. And all Armenians watch Russian TVs, let's say, which is forbidden in many European countries because it's clear-cut propaganda, and they are under that propaganda. And in this situation, uh, the only way to keep the power, let's say Nicole Pashinyan, if he wants to keep the power, he needs to uh, create, oh, let's no. say, better relations with Russia, which is to implement what they will ask. Let's take an example. You remember that Nicole Pashinyan spoke about 16 million of misused money uh, yeah. in uh, South Caucasian railroads, Yuzhne Kavkazke, Zhlezne, Daroki. And then Lavrov spoke against that and told never dare to speak about this, it will stop. I mean, how we can fight the corruption in Armenia where all main fields of Armenian economy, energy, gas, uh, railroads, and many other parts, uh, nuclear power station, are given to Russia uh, or as property or them as a concession. The, this is the problem. Uh, the people very often uh, tell us, I mean, I mean national democratic uh, poll of Armenia, Asgan Jogutavarakan Bever, okay, speak more pro-Russian be more pro-Russian to have more votes. They are right. If you aim, your goal is just to have votes and become a member of parliament. But it's not our aim. We want to improve the situation. We don't are running after the chair in, in parliament. And this is the case. They Everybody knows that Russia controls the inner situation in the country. And this is that we are in a position when we speak frankly, clearly, which happened in uh, Armenia, we can see that Russian propaganda always uh, is uh, 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 creating a big uh, anti, uh, let's say, uh, the, the poll, Hakka Beverakan, let's say, anti poll uh, movement and uh, commentaries all over there. And I am sure that after this program, we'll see that many of them will write against me and against other political powers that see the reality. It's a lot of falsifications, the call and name, uh, Sorosakan, uh, uh, and many, many other things uh, because they want people to 
be just on the Russian influence. And, uh, but uh, we don't want to be one of that 17 parties that, you know, they are fighting uh, Nicole Pashinyan, but they are fighting in that way that uh, showing Russia that we are more pro Russian. As happened with Nicole Pashinyan. Nicole Pashinyan was criticizing uh, Ser Sarkisian to be very pro Russian. And now he came and became uh, mm-hmm. more pro Russian than Ser Sarkisian or Kocharyan's were. Because at least uh, 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 Ser Sarkisian rejected to send uh, a unit from our army against the West in Syria. But uh, Nicole Pashinyan, Nicole Pashinyan did. did. And it's very strange when people say, why West did not support Armenia during the war? Are you foolish? You are fighting against them, against Western interests. And you are asking West to support you. Be thankful to United States and West that Armenia is not under punishment, under the blockade, because other country, I am sure, if instead of Armenia, there was another country doing the same, sending a unit uh, on the Russian flag to Syria, the country would become uh, uh, under punishment and blockade. But until now, we are getting support from West uh, in money, in technology, and humanitarian aid. This is uh, the, the situation, what they have on the ground. Uh, what do you think, Mr. Papian, after this war, so it was obvious what's going on, what's, who is our enemy, who is our ally. Is there any changes in uh, people's mind, I mean, like in values? Is there any changes? What do you think? Yes, we can feel that we are uh, having more and more support from people. Uh, and uh, people are changing their minds because you have to be blind to not to see what is going on. Also, people are concerned, even afraid of the situation. Because if before the war, the understanding was that Russia will not leave Armenia alone. Now they are saying, even people who are saying will not leave alone. But you can feel that they are not sure saying this. This is very important part. They are not sure because they know that and they understand that for Russia, uh, relationship with Turkey and Azerbaijan, especially when they will gain this direct access to Turkey, is much more important. I want to uh, underline that in uh, 2023, the trade between uh, Russia and Turkey will reach up to $100 million, billion, $100 billion. It's the highest volume that may, maybe China will be the first, uh, Turkey will be uh, the second one. And also, uh, the uh, Turkey is playing the card of Turkic speaking people within Russia very well, blackmailing Russia and gaining, let's say, the concessions from Russia. Also, Crimea. Crimea is one of the, uh, let's say, fields of uh, future confrontation, Russians and Turks. Uh, I'm sure that in future, there will be a confrontation between Russians and Turks. But when will be this this future? Will be it after several years or several decades? It's enough time for Armenia to lose uh, territories or maybe statehood. This is that we have to act very quickly. We have to apply and diaspora can be uh, the part or forerunner of this situation with the Western countries explaining the danger that uh, Armenia is currently. We are really in danger. If we compare uh, the situation uh, in Armenia or around Armenia, Maybe this is the most endangered country currently in the world, because even the other countries who are fighting each other, the level of hate is not so high. 
let's say Arabs and Israelis, they live together. There are more than 1 million Arabs in Israel living there. Uh, Arabs uh, coming and going to Israel uh, for work. Uh, Israelis, uh, they go to many Arab countries, uh, Egypt, and also some countries of uh, Persian Gulf and so on. We can, can, they have this confrontation there in many other parts, but people more or less live together. We have seen that uh, when one, two or five uh, civilians remained in Armenian villages in Nagorno-Karabakh, they were tortured and killed. Most, the, the, even they were not part of any army. Even we know that civilians were take uh, into prison after signing that uh, infamous uh, ceasefire. Even not citizens of Armenia. We know that two citizens of Lebanon and now they are, uh, Azeris are saying that they were, uh, were mercenaries fighting Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh. Even everyone knows that we're just, uh, they were civilians living there. They escaped the uh, situation in uh, uh, Lebanon, unfortunately met another worse situation in uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Mr. Robin, uh, I just uh, remember that on the beginning of the war, when the European countries, they uh, start to blame Turkey in being involved in the war. Do you uh, remember in Vienna, uh, what's happened? Some guy took a gun and killed many people on the streets in, in Austria. Mm -hmm. Does that mean like any countries which will dare to speak aloud against of action Turkeys, even illegal action Turkeys, uh, they will be punished. That's why maybe uh, Russian is like uh, as a hostage. Uh, yes, um, the countries are blackmailed by Turkey several times, uh, especially Russia. Uh, advisor to uh, president of uh, Turkey uh, several times told that there are over 20 million Turkish people living in Russia and they can destroy the country from within. The same, let's say, with uh, Europe. Uh, Erdogan was blackmailing uh, European countries, especially Germany, France, uh, that you will have problems. It's, uh, in reality, they had that problems, as you mentioned already. And now there are some li uh, linkage of information from uh, military intelligence that, and head of military intelligence of Turkey spoke about that, that many political activists in uh, Europe were killed uh, by the order of uh, state of Turkey. They were, let's say, of Kurdish origin, of local origin, and so on. Uh, this uh, really because uh, creates a hard situation for the countries. Uh, and you know, yeah, the European civilization now is non-confrontational. The understanding is if we will be nice. warm, soft, nice to others, others also will be, uh, have, will have the, the same approach to, to us. It's not a uh, realistic vision. What is going on in Europe now, Armenia has passed a millennium ago, maybe 700 years ago. The same situation was when Turks that came to Armenia, historical Armenia, they were in minority. And then step by step from year to year, from century to century, they gained power and then political power and then economic power. And the final stage was the, the genocide. Uh, the final aim of these people in Europe is the same to gain power and the final stage will be genocide of local people in Europe. They do not understand this because it's impossible to 
understand uh, that kind of reality because people think, okay, it's 21st century, what is possible? It's possible, it's quite possible, which is going on already on the territory of Turkey. They are killing people. They had done genocide and the genocide is going on against many people. And if they will have the possibility to repeat that genocide in Armenia or in Europe, they will do that. Or in Russia, even in Russia as well. Uh, regardless of the, the Russian uh, approach uh, to Turkey. Sophie? Um, Mr. Papian, I was going to ask again about, um, so you mentioned uh, the role of diaspora briefly, and I want to ask you, um, I think personally many Armenians are often under the impression that we must rely on Russia for security guarantees and uh, other things because they don't see a way out. And as you mentioned, Russia is also kind of in the same situation where they see Armenia as having no other other um, a party to turn to, uh, which creates this toxicity in the relationship between Russia and Armenia. Um, and so in your opinion, how can you see this transition out of um, out of the out from under the Russian uh, thumb, uh, how can you see this na being navigated in a safe and secure fashion, um, avoiding any kind of uh, escalation of conflict or anything like that? Especially now, with the presence of Russian peacekeepers in Karabakh for the first time, and also the presence of um, Turkish uh, presence in the area for the first time in a very long time, that has definitely changed the dynamic in the area. So can you speak to um, the role of the peacekeepers in the area? Uh, how, how can we uh, disentangle ourselves from uh, Russian influence? And what is the role of the diaspora moving forward um, if, we, if we want to align ourselves with the West and with the United States? Um, can we capitalize on that involvement as well? Uh, you are right that there are many in diaspora that are very, very pro-Russian and they are speaking about keeping this Russian influence over Armenia and this, uh, usually I tell them that come to live in Armenia under that circumstances because you are endangering with your uh, steps and speeches our lives that we live in Armenia. Come live in Armenia or go live in Russia. Why you are staying in New York, Paris, and somewhere and speaking about uh, uh, Russian uh, positive influence over what you have seen and what you know about Russian influence? I already told that the mother of this all corruption is uh, in Armenia is Russia. It's impossible to fight corruption in Armenia because the all fields, all these uh, major. Uh, the industry, uh, uh, everything belongs to Russia. Uh, secondly, who was supplying uh, weapons, ammunition uh, to, 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 to Azerbaijan? Russia. Who was in favor taking as peacekeepers Turks in South Caucasus? Not West, it was Russia. And now we have 60 so-called, uh, 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 they're not called uh, peacekeepers, but some monitor. kind of instructors, Mo uh, Mo monitor monitorers. Yeah, let's say yeah. they, they have to uh, have this military monitoring, to do military monitoring in there. 60 Turks and 60 Russians. Why? Why Turkey was given some kind of, this of privilege? Turkey was not part of Troika. It was uh, Russia, France, and the United States. And by the way, United States proposed Armenia to send uh, Scandinavian peacekeepers uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh. Why Armenia rejected this proposal? Some people say it was just a proposal. How do you know? They proposed, gave your consent to that, and then we'll see, was it just a word? or they would uh, implement the, the, their promise. The same with France. France at least twice proposed Armenia ammunitions and new 
let's say, fifth generation weapons. Why Nikol Pashinyan refused them to the because as a result of he wants to be a good guy for Russians because Russians will not be satisfied of that. And because of this, not having this modern weapons, we gave thousands and thousands more victims in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, what we have to do, uh, first of all, in Karabakh conflict, we have to do everything to restore uh, the uh, Troika of Minsk group. I mean, United States, France, and Russia, all three countries must be involved in the solution of Nagorno-Karabakh, which means we have to, we have to underline that Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is going on. It wasn't solved by a war because war was a viol violation of the first principle that always was discussed uh, during these almost 30 years of uh, negotiations, not using the force. The second one was self-determination of people and just the third one was the, the, the so-called integrity of the borders. And what we have now, only Azeris gained of this situation. And this is why, at least in the first stage, involvement of uh, United States and France. The second one, direct negotiations with the United States to become non-NATO, uh, it's called major non-NATO ally to United States. There is a special law in the United States Many countries have this status. Well, let's say South uh, Korea, uh, Israel, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Why we can't, we have at least uh, to negotiate this, to try to have it. And if Russia will betray Armenia, they will betray it anyway. Uh, this is the case. Um, we do not have other choice. We have to find uh, other countries, uh, maybe alongside with Russia, alongside with Russia to, to secure our, our safety of, uh, of the country, of the people in Armenia, because the economy, the, and also we need more investment. Can Russia have uh, this investment in Armenia in near future? I have uh, big doubts, not because Russia, uh, herself is in their situation. They do not have real money to do this. And the, uh, uh, Putin spoke about uh, uh, food, uh, how it called food uh, stamps for, 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 for people in Russia. It shows that Russia even cannot feed for people. The biggest country in the world that before Russian revolution was exporting uh, wheat, grain, and everything, meat, now they cannot even feed themselves. And now they have to have these food stamps and so on of, of all the people. And you or others believe that Russia will uh, give Armenia more than to uh, her uh, oblast uh, or, or gubernia or to republics within Russia? No. We do not have border with Russia. If Russia even wants to protect Armenia, it will be very hard. Why they now have this so-called peacekeeper mission in Nagorno-Karabakh? It's a military base. It's not peacekeeping mission because we have seen that uh, what kind of weapons are there. And also we have an information that... Uh, around 20,000 people can be deployed within that territory. I mean, the housing is for 20,000 people. Even now, there are almost 2,000 peacekeepers there. This shows that Russia is preparing a new military base. Why? Because supplying the base in Gumri is almost impossible for now because Georgia has closed the border. But the uh, military base in north part of Karabakh is very close to the Russian Federation. And the railroad comes up to Barda. Barda is a town near 
Nagorno Karabakh, and from there they will build uh, the railway to Stepanakert and to other parts, which means they can supply their military base by the railroad, which is very important. And also they do not see Turkey as a threat for themselves, but it's a threat for us. The, do, uh, this is the problem. They will not fight Turks for Armenians. Wow, can you imagine what is $100 million trade? What is uh, billion and billion dollars per year going into pockets of Putin and people around him? Do you really believe that they will sacrifice all this for poor Armenians? They will not do this. Maybe we'll ask, and will Americans do this? I'm not sure, but this is the only way because at least in the United States, uh, it's, it's a democratic country and the lobby can has an effect. We have more than 100 uh, congressmen, 50 senators uh, supporting Armenian case and we have all these structures we can do. And the United States, they are interested to have this uh, double containment policy in South Caucasus to contain Turkey and Russia coming together. As I told, the, this synergy of these two countries is very dangerous for West because these two countries are anti-Western. What makes them to come together, this anti-Western position? Both countries have hate West. They, uh, and it's the, the based, the, their, let's say, the policy is based on their approach against the West. Uh, and this unifies them. Okay. Yes, you mentioned also, um, you spoke to the importance of investments in, in Armenia um, and uh, the economic situation in Russia um, uh, declining. Do you think that could be um, one of the uh, factors that can um, bring us closer to America and the West is the increased maybe uh, investment of um members of the diaspora that live in the uh, the United States may be um, repatriating, returning to Armenia, or at least investing money in Armenia and kind of increasing that presence, the Western presence in the region. Um, can you speak a little bit more to um, uh, the importance of and how can we align with the United States and the West? Uh, is there a way for us to kind of broker that relationship? What can we do? Uh, we have to realize that Armenia needs much more money that uh, diaspora has that capacity. We have seen that during the war, diaspora was doing her best and $100 million were collected because it was totally $170 million. $70 million was given by Armenia. I mean, the capacity of uh, diaspora is 100 million, not more. And it cannot be done each year because diaspora has to satisfy uh, her existence, uh, has her expenses there, keeping schools, lot of organizations, so on. And we know that the, they are the same pockets. The money is not on the trees. The, and the economic situation now, it's also because of COVID is not in a good condition. This shows that only a country, a state can help. Let, let's say for the United States, they can implement a program like Marshall program or so that it was done after World War II, touch South Caucasus, at least for Armenia or Georgia, all of this case. And then let's say for the United States, couple of billions of dollars per year it's not big money, it's almost nothing. The important thing is the political decision for the United States. And we see diaspora, at least I see diaspora, mainly as a lobbyist of this idea to make closer politically Armenia and the United States. And why I am preparing all these uh, historical documents uh, on Woodrow Wilson, his papers, and a lot of other uh, 
official documents showing that we have closed because I understand that creating this atmosphere of friendship that we had over million, 100 years, it will help us. Uh, this is a, a creation better political relations with the United States with the help of the diaspora, diaspora as a bridge between Armenian government and US government. But here we have a big problem of the, the Armenian government. Last year, I was lobbying for several months just to get a couple of square meters of land in Yerevan in proper place to erect a statue for Woodrow Wilson as uh, a person who saved 132,000 orphans in American orphanages. Let's forget for, for now the arbitral award, just a humanitarian support. Over $1 billion at that time was given to Armenia, I mean to Armenians not only to state, but to Armenians, which means it over uh, $22 billion in uh, today's rate. It's huge money. And it was the biggest uh, ever support uh, that United States did at that time. I mean, uh, after World War I. And uh, we have to first be thankful for United States, but Nicole Pashinyan, did not uh, answer to my uh, letters, to my calls. And even with the centennial of official relationship between Armenia and the United States, because the United States recognized the Republic of Armenia on April 23, 1920, was ignored. The centennial of arbitral award by Woodrow Wilson was ignored. Everything that uh, deals uh, or relates to the United States is ignored in Armenia. And this is why in this situation, I have uh, doubts that the uh, Pashinyan government will have courage and political will to act properly. Because just refusing uh, for small land uh, for monument, because the main problem was Russian attitude. What will be the Russian response to that? We all remember with this uh, Najdeh statue that each time they're blaming Armenia and uh, Najdeh that being pro-Nazi and so on, when everybody knows that uh, Najdeh never was uh, pro-Nazi in terms, he never uh, fought against Soviet army and even uh, in official documents, the conviction is not, there is no mention of uh, cooperation or collaboration with Nazis or fascists. He, he just, he's, uh, he was reminded that he was fighting Bolsheviks in 1920, in May uh, 1920 up to July 1921. Uh, I, I think uh, Armenia needs mostly political investment, not money. Because even the billions will fall to the Armenia, billions, it will be just pocketed uh, by someone. It will be not any changes there. If there is no political investment in Armenia, if the political system is will be stay the same, there will be nothing changed. But if the political system will change, become more uh, civil, not, uh, for me, there's two polit political systems. This is Russian political system and Western. Right? Russian corrupt political system and the Western more uh, democratic system. If Armenia will become more democratic, democratic system, political wise, there will be a lot of changes. And even a couple millions, they will make sense. But if we'll stay the same corrupt system, and the billions, billions will flow to Armenia, there will be no any changes. This is my belief. Sophie? Um, yeah, based on the what you just uh, mentioned about the, the political process and the importance of shifting our um, government processes to um, distance from 
Russian corruption and the Russian uh, way of going about things in, in, in our politics. And so how can we build an Armenian government that puts the Armenian national interest above everything else, above Russian interest, above uh, Russian economic interest, political interest, and, and uh, their, um, their, their needs above ours? How, how can we push for um, a government that will put our needs first? I totally agree with uh, Vartan that uh, everything is based on political situation, political investment, how it can be changed. Support the parties and forces in Armenia that are eager to create a national independent state. This is the, uh, the because without uh, solving this basic step, the rest, uh, it's meaningless. Uh, yeah, but it, it can have some short uh, term, term uh, effect and so on, but in the long term, see, Nagorno Karabakh, we were speaking of recognition of Karabakh uh, as part of Armenia based on League of Nations, this and so on. And uh, because of that, Armenia uh, it would be possible to blame Armenia as an aggressor. They didn't listen us. And so we lost Karabakh, at least for, for this time. And with hundreds and hundreds billions of dollars investment there, this is, I was asking diaspora for tens of thousand dollars to keep alive my TV in Yerevan that was broadcasting in Talishi language, in local languages of uh, local people, uh, Ochtoton people in uh, Azerbaijan, also some, in some languages in Turkey. I was refused. That all money went to Karabakh to build churches and so on, maybe some schools. My understanding was it's better to make weaker from within Azerbaijan to destroy that country because it's a permanent danger for Armenia. Okay, I was ignored. The money went because you know the approach of diaspora. Okay, the money went there because, and especially to Karabakh, as I told already, because in Karabakh, it was much easier to stole the money because it was totally under, out of control any. And so what we see, uh, the money, what is the result of the money that where, which was in, invested in, 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 in Karabakh? What, what, where are the schools? Where are the hospitals? Where are the roads there? This is the case. First, the issue, political issues must be solved in Armenia, in Turkey, and in Azerbaijan. And rest comes over that. Without that, it's meaningless to, to do anything, anything, because for a short time, it will give a positive effect. Later, we lost this one. And now support the forces and parties in Armenia um, to calm them into power, and then they will implement the national uh, program and national ideas. Otherwise, okay, Nikol Pashinyan is saying and his group that we have to open the borders with Turkey if they even want to uh, they set their preconditions because they put, put some preconditions, refusal of genocide, refusal of any Armenian claims. We have to officially, speak, and I don't know what will be Nikol's decision. And nobody knows. Because one day he can just wake up and we can uh, watch and listen on his life that he's uh, speaking about that very important things as he used to do without any consultation with, uh, with any party, any group, including his party or his faction in uh, parliament. Sorry. 
Thank you. I think so. I also want to ask you, moving on a little bit uh, to the role of the European Court of Human Rights in this case and in uh, these disputed territories uh, questions. Um, there are a number of uh, conflicts among post-Soviet states that have been presented to the European Court of Human Rights and um, now obviously in the case of Armenia against Azerbaijan and reciprocally Azerbaijan against Armenia. So do you think that it's a, a, a positive thing, a good thing that countries are bringing their claims to the uh, European Court of Rights or um, on the other hand, the court may try to stay out of these conflicts because of the complexity of the evidence and the complicated underlying political issues and the fact that the court is not really designed as an effective adjudicator of humanitarian law. So what exactly is the role of um, this court in cases like this? And do you think this is something we should be appealing to or not? Uh, Azerbaijan uh, complained to European Court of Human Rights of Armenian violation of humanitarian law, as well Armenia did. But this nothing has to do with territories. This is just humanitarian law. I mean, it's, it's loss of properties, loss of life, uh, obstacles for their uh, invest and so on. This is international private law. I mean, uh, the, it deals with people, with person, and it's not common. the territory. And for territory, we have to go international uh, court of justice, which is part of United Nations, and there to discuss the issue of validity, let's say the arbitral award, League of Nations. Uh, decisions, and many, many other things. Uh, the borders, uh, let, let's say the question, one of the questions uh, can be, uh, are um, the borders of Union republics or where they uh, considered as international borders, yes or not? Or uh, can Soviet Republic Union consider as subject of international law? These are very fundamental questions. And after that, uh, well, the, our claims can be based on it. If not, I mean, if they are not uh, subjects of international law, the borders cannot, and so on. But this will take at least, I want to underline, at least several years. It's not uh, so easy to do. And we can see that uh, for now, uh, we uh, did not receive, and I'm sure will not receive, any support from government, any support for the for government to do this. Uh, this is done and was done, is done by uh, a group of people, by their support. Uh, one of these, uh, Ayastana Menking, uh, we are Armenian and so on. But, uh, you, you see, it's almost the same situation when FIDAI groups are fighting uh, 21st century army with Bayraktars because uh, their capacity and possibilities are, are uh, much wider. And uh, we, let's say we have problems uh, to buy the, the documents that we need. I, 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 uh, let's say just only to buy the collection of the documents that are available now. They are available, they are published. We need at least $50,000. We need another, let's say ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 just for National Archives of the United States to buy the documents. It's just buying. It's not reading and uh, classifying them. It, it, uh, uh, let's say in one DVD, uh, it's almost 1,000 pages of documents. You have to read all these documents to understand, to see which one can be used and in which way. This, this is very hard uh, job. I was proposing, I proposed to uh, Kochairan in 2003, all these things. And my goal was to prepare for 2015. 
I did not receive any support. And at that time, I was considering that within 12 years, it is possible to do. As I mentioned already that in Titernak Albert in January 2015, there was all nations, that is Hamas Gayin, uh, um, the declaration that we have to prepare all these files, these Tachtat what, what are the results? Nothing was done. Nothing was done until now. And from 2015 now, 21, six years, within six days, nothing was done. Uh, as long as we are here, just I want to remind uh, the people who can watch us now live and later on. So we start the process of uh, lawsuit on the AGA International Accord uh, to finalize the program uh, which Arapapia mentioned it. So we need uh, financial support. As Arapapia says, there's a lot of expenses which can handle like state. It's very difficult for us to do that, but we have no choice. If we will, we will not do that. State will not do that. We will lose whatever we have, whatever is remain. So please uh, support the program. We are Armenia and the uh, Arapapian project to just to save a country. Sophia. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, again on the international international law topic, I think. Uh, Russia deals with international law in a very selective way. I think Russian law or Russian constitutional uh, provisions are um, allow Russian law to be placed above international law. How do you think this plays out in a conflict like this? Uh, Russia is becoming more and more isolated and anti-Western. Just last week, Lavrov, Minister of Foreign Affairs, spoke about uh, limitation uh, of all kinds of contacts and relationship with uh, the European Union, uh, to, to, which uh, means that uh, another uh, iron curtain we may be sooner we close Russia. But the problem for us, we are, Armenia is part of the so-called Europe, uh, Euro, Euro Asian uh, Economic uh, Union. This, uh, this organization headed by Russia, which means that we one more time will remain on the other side of this Iron Curtain with the very, very negative uh, consequences for us because there will be no investments in Armenia, no real market in Armenia uh, because Russian market also uh, becoming poor and poor. Uh, this will give Armenia, let's say in this way, pro-Russian uh, policy of Armenia will give Armenia just to survive uh, losing step-by-step -step territories, uh, sovereignty, and so on. But at the end, the end world total destruction of the country. Our approach is a fundamental change of policy. Is it risky? Yes. Is it, but it's the only way. It's the, almost the same when you have a close relative that you know if you will not do anything, he or she will die because the process going there and you have a risky operation. But the only way that that person will be saved or the possibility will be that will be saved on going to the surgery. It's up to you to decide. My understanding is it's better to try now, to try now. Otherwise, uh, uh, within, I don't know, 10, 15 years, uh, the, the population of Armenia will uh, be less uh, than 2 million people. 
and half of that will be retired people and the country has no uh, real possibilities for the development because uh, without investment and without a new mar new markets for armenia and most of all without safety armenia cannot survive cannot survive uh, Mr. Papayan, uh, you many times uh, emphasized Russian West, Russian West. What is exactly the reason of this confrontation? What is the which is the major difference between these, uh, say, parties? It's irrational approach of Russians. They consider themselves, as they say, a separate, different civilization. Russian civilization, and they see themselves as the second pole of the world, as it was during Soviet time, it was the West and Soviet Union. But Soviet Union at that time was the second economy in the world after United States, even ahead of Europe. It was around 15%. Uh, some 14% was Europe and some 23% United States. Now, United States, again, they are one fourth, 20% or even 26% of world economy. The same European Union, which means they together more than half, and Russia just 1.4%. 1.4%. Without oil and gas, Russian economy is smaller than economy of Portugal economy of the poorest country in the European Union. I mean, Russian economy is smaller without gas and oil. And you know that new technologies, uh, they are changing approach to these uh, uh, fuels and use of uh, 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 gas and oil. And in new, first of all, we, uh, we, we see that new technologies will make people to use less. And secondly, uh, Russian gas and oil always will be higher. The cost, self cost of this is higher than Arabo Iranian, just because it's in the Siberia, uh, in, in the, on the cold kind of weather and hard conditions and, and so on. It's an irrational approach uh, because they, see West as a danger, but in reality, the main danger for Russia comes from two directions. From South is the Turkey and Turkish people and Turkey countries, and from East China. And thanks to West, Russia until now keeps the integrity of the territory because West does not want to give to China, Siberia, and the resources that are there. And this is why West supporting Russia against China, because West understands if China will gain control over that huge resources, and because in the world, all resources already are being used, just Siberia remains the main, uh, I don't know, warehouse oh. of, of of raw so, material. Okay. Yeah, and China with Siberia will be not only the biggest country, it will be the strongest country. And this is why uh, until now, uh, West is keeping integrity of Russia. They want in a way to control. And here we have another danger for us. It's quite probable that it's high possibility that if Armenia will not gain the role of uh, containing Turkey and Russia, West will give the role of containment China over Siberia to Turkey. Because we know that Turks, uh, and in the maps, you can, you can see on the, on the maps, they want to show that all these ter territories belong to Turk because Yakutia, they are uh, Turkic-speaking people, Kazakhstan, all these parts 
all Siberia is their homeland from northern China up to Siberia. This is really very dangerous situation for us because if West instead of Armenia will choose as the main ally against China, Turkey, then we have no chance to survive. Then we have to just take our suitcases, go to Russia or, Tom, or come to the United States because Armenia uh, in that situation has, has no choice to survive. Uh, you know what, uh, somehow Armenia survived being squeezed between Azerbaijan, Turkey and Russia and there is no any support, but somehow Armenia survived, right? And, yeah, uh, survived because 100 years ago, when we look to the map of the region, Armenia was not a big country, but Armenians were living from Constantinople to Baku, from uh, Krasnodar uh, up to Tavriz or Baghdad. And in some parts, they were majority there. And uh, the, there was a big support. We survived because we were paying by our lives and by our territory for that survival. And now we are just 29,000 square kilometers Republic of Armenia plus another 2,000 in Nagorno-Karabakh that Armenians live there. Another 3,000 square kilometers in Georgia that Armenians live there. I mean, the territory that Armenians are, are living now, it's 20 times smaller that used to be 100 years ago. This okay. is a huge difference within 100 years, which means we do not have any territory or possible to retreat. We used to that. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, when he was thinking over his project and arbitration, why he gave access to see all these four territories? Because he told that Armenia must be a viable state. This is important, viable state. And to be viable, Armenia needs to have at least 160, 165,000 square kilometers access, free access to sea and demilitarization of Turkey and Western support. Uh, because I do not speak very often about demilitarization and Western support because mainly I deal with the territories. But arbitral war has three main pillars, territory, demilitarization and access to sea, because these three are very important for Armenian survival. Why the mandate over Armenia was given to the United States? Because the understanding and rightful understanding was that Armenia needs at least 20 years uh, this for changes or adopting herself to be a real state. The problem with Armenian modern state is that we, de jure, regained our independence, but de facto, we never were independent state. Russia was controlling over Armenia always through her agents, through her uh, high officials. We all know, even now, we know that many high officials are direct agents of KGB. Can you imagine country where people will gather in the main philharmonic hall of the country, one of the main, and speak against the statehood of their country, which is violation of the article number one of Armenian constitution, because it said that Armenia is an independent, mm -hmm. sovereign state. And they will speak about becoming part of Russia and our security forces and our government did nothing, nothing. When they did. we were- They did, uh, Mr. When Pardon, we they were, organized. Oh, sorry? They did, they organized. Maybe they organized. When we organized a, a manifestation against that, infamous ceasefire of November 9, 
we did on November 12th. Maybe around 2,000 people came to uh, for that manifestation. And the police was twice more and then attacked us. And then uh, we were taken to police and so on. Why? Because they wanted to show to the Moscow, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, the Ooh. creators, uh, uh, bosses that you see when people speak about independence in Armenia, will punish them, will punish them. That, that was. But when you will speak becoming part of Russia, and the foolish thing is that even becoming, they do not understand that even becoming part of Russia, nothing will be changed. It's not Soviet Union, because uh, during Soviet time, at least the property belonged to state, and state more or less uh, was giving uh, some kind of support to everyone, every republic. No, everything belongs to uh, uh, private uh, people or organizations and, and so on. If Russia cannot support herself, go out from Moscow, 100 kilometers away from uh, uh, Moscow, you, you will see that it's, it's 19th century. 19th century. That's okay. Right. How we think that uh, and why uh, Russians would come with big money and where they will find that money invest in Armenia for what? To uh, degradate their relationship with Turkey, with one of the main trade partners? For what they will do that? I do understand the Russians. I, uh, I am against their policy, but I understand. They have no other choice. The, the only choice is to become part of West, they don't want to become part of the West. They see themselves higher than everyone. This is some kind of chauvinistic approach, 19th century and, and so on, but it's up to them. Which will, at the end, and saying at the end, I mean within five years, will bring to collapse of Russia, totally. Russian Federation will have the same fate as Soviet Union had. And this is the time to predict that at least to create some possibilities when Titanic will go down into the sea, at least to have the place in, in the boat because the iceberg already hit the Russian Titanic. Okay, the orchestra is playing now and everybody is listening that nice music, but the Titanic is going down because when you compare all the ec economic indications and military indications from month to month, you can see that uh, everything is going down in Russia, including uh, psychological and political situation within Russia. Uh, in my understanding, Mr. Krabian, most of confrontation based on the tradition uh, way to govern people, because in the European country, I don't believe the president would stay there 20 years or more. I mean, the situation with uh, freedom, human, human rights, I mean, the basic of confrontation, I think, uh, is hidden there, not only like we are first economic or second economic, it's not big, making big difference. I think the major confrontation is based on human rights and tradition, how to control people and government. Sorry, sorry, you are right. And this is why I am saying that we have more chances in the West to yep. prove our rights, to lobby our rights, uh, because you are right, there are democratic societies. This is why, let's say, Armenian community in the United States is lobbying for Armenia. And Armenian communities in Russia is lobbying for Russia against Armenia. It's a tool in the hand of Russian government, Armenian community, or oh, let's say major part of that community because Armenians are hostage there. They cannot, it's not uh, the country because they know that uh, if they would even write 
something, a statement in Facebook that Russians will not agree with that. The tax controllers will come and control you uh, until the last day. Sophie? Um, Mr. Papian, I have a question regarding uh, Russia again. Do you think that um, a, a, a possibly a Russia post-Putin regime could be more Western oriented or kind of uh, shift some of the some of the uh, perspectives of Russia. I know that uh, Putin has been uh, obviously a very, very long standing actor. And uh, is it possible that after he would be gone that some of these attitudes might shift or change or no? Uh, Putin will be gone and he will go on very soon because he has cancer and uh, he is looking who will succeed him. But the problem is that uh, power succession will not be based on democratic elections. They are fighting, there are at least two main groups within Kremlin that they are fighting each other who will be the main successor. Because who will be the leader of the country, all economic gains will be in his hands. Because uh, being president in Russia means uh, your friends will become billionaires as Putin's old friends, his childhood friends all became billionaires and everything would burn. It will be very aggressive and hard fighting is going on. Unfortunately, I do not see possibility. I would like, but I can't see possibility uh, for Russia to becoming more democratic. It's not the, the traditions because also the people there, the propaganda, uh, Putin's propaganda, at least uh, for last 10 years, uh, uh, has changed the, the positive, uh, has reversed, let's say, the positive changes that happened in Russia during Yeltsin time. And they see the uh, West, as I told, as the main enemy. And uh, they see themselves as saviors of the world, uh, not only Armenia. Uh, when you tell them the real history of Armenia, how they promised and never uh, supported Armenia, uh, they are surprised because uh, their understanding was that they always were saving Armenians, as many Armenians think, think until now. Uh, we, we, we saw that uh, Navalny tried to, uh, one of the, the leaders or main leader of the opposition to bring some changes, but now he is convicted uh, up to three years in jail and uh, uh, it seems Russia is ignoring. But the problem is that Russia cannot survive now without Western support. And also there is another problem. The money of Russian oligarchs and family members of Russian oligarchs are in, in West, in London, Paris, in New York, and so on. And this is why they are uh, do not agree with policy of Putin because they know that they all will be put under sanctions, which means that they, they uh, will not be able to use their money, their properties, and they have castles all over the world. Uh, they have this property. And the, let's say one part at least want to keep more or less normal relations with uh, West, but generally speaking, uh, not re being real de democracy. For Armenia, it's much easier. Armenia is a small society. Also, uh, the big difference between Russia and Armenia is that Russia is a big country, and Russia can survive another 50 years being not democracy and having this uh, unaffected uh, economy.
Russia will lose some territories, maybe uh, Siberia, maybe some other parts, but even losing big territories, Russia will remain the biggest country in Europe by territory, I mean, which gives a lot of possibilities to the country. For Armenia, we already sp uh, spoke that we lost everything that we had, let's say, 100 years ago. And the last losses were three, four months ago, 10,000 square kilometers in Karabakh, which aggravated our security situation uh, in that part of, of Armenia. Uh, so uh, the choices are these two are uh, two with Russia, which will give, will not give any new opportunities. Everything will remain the same, which means the population will decrease. The people will uh, emigrate from Armenia. Everything will become uh, more. Uh, Weak. Weak uh, mashats. Worn uh, out. Worn it out. So. Ah, worn out. Everything will worn out, uh, out because uh, let's say, let's take again railroads. They're controlling Armenian railroads from 2008, which means uh, over 12, 12 uh, 13 years. All the investments that, that are, they're only on the papers. And when you go and check with this investment, nothing is there. And now with this new railroad that uh, Azerbaijan will build along Arax River, Megri and Nakhichevan, Turkey and to Europe, will stay without anything. And because of uh, Russian policy of keeping Armenia isolated from other parts of the world, namely, let's say, from West. Mr. Fabian, we, uh, we didn't want, but we spoke a lot uh, about Russia. Let's go back to Armenia. So we have a situation which is uh, very dangerous and very weak, and we don't see actually the future clear, but they must be an exit. They must be a way for, uh, to solve the situation. And what do you think? What kind of actions we need to make? What we need to do? First, to have in Armenia new government, new parliament with more experience, political will, and uh, knowledge to change the situation, geopolitical situation, security situation in Armenia. Uh, the country, uh, which is Russia, is the main source of Armenian problem, cannot be the main uh, solution. Uh, solution. Uh, solution. The government in, in Armenia is the source of problems in Armenia. That, which means that government cannot be the source of solution. New people have to come. New with world vision, national vision. We have to change a lot of laws, constitution. What means that uh, people that possess two passports, double citizenship, for last four years cannot held public and uh, other positions in Armenia, high positions, which means that diaspora is out of game because mainly diaspora and Armenian have another citizenship. Who will renounce his or her citizenship now in order to have a possibility after four years to participate in some kind of elections. Nobody will do this. And when the government speaks about closer relations with diaspora, this means that more diaspora involvement, direct involvement, 
and political involvement in Armenian life. This is very important. I mean, changing domestic situation, also another approach to uh, security issues. Let's negotiate with Americans, with Western powers, with China, uh, to have a second military base in Armenia. Why Kyrgyzstan could have for a long time Russian and American military bases in her territory and Armenia cannot, at least for now, for five, 10 years, when we are really in real danger real danger because we see our neighbors preparing for another war. Will Russian military base willing or capable to fight back uh, Turkey? I'm not sure. And security issues are very, very important. You cannot rely on, as Russians say, uh, avos, maybe. It's, it's not maybe. Even when there is a lift ascensor, uh, uh, stairs, very lucky. stairs, che, che, che. elevator, che. elevator, ascensor in France, uh, elevator, it has at least two or three special cables because it's uh, one can be cut uh, just for secure. Uh, for security, it's an, a life issue for four people that are within cabin. It's just life of four. In Armenia, over two million people live. And we have just one cable in this big uh, cabin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we are saying, no, no, it, it, it will survive. It, it will uh, keep lifting us up. If, what if not? And, what and if it, not? And, and it, didn't, uh, it didn't work. It's too much worn out and it's old and this is used out already. It's not uh, uh, keeping the weight. Okay, if even we uh, think that it's uh, in good condition, anyway, when it comes to people life, only one cable, one line of safety or security is not enough. This is if we see this for uh, also for the cars. Why we put this all special uh, uh, balloons in the car and so? Because of that, this, I don't know, these pillows, uh, air, uh, how it's called? Uh, Airbags. Uh, Bella. Airbags. What? Ah, um, Airbus and so on. Because we think that it's possible that there will be an accident and people must have chance to, to survive. But what about people of the country? Is it possible to have that kind of accident? Again, a war, it's quite possible. Is it possible that our ally, Russia, will not support Armenia or will be late? Quite possible. As usual. And Oh, yes, as usual. And why, when we speak about the second safety line, people say that we are anti-Russian. We are pro-Armenian. We think about our country's life. We don't want uh, people to stay in danger because we have seen in Karabakh that Russia has a lot of obligations over Armenia, but never did. Never fulfilled that. Uh, Mr. Propian, the main reason uh, that's why we uh, communicating in English. Uh, so uh, give the chance uh, our people, English spe uh, speaking people, to have understand, uh, understanding about the situation in Armenia. Because I don't believe there is another source for fair information. That's why we communicating now in, in English, which is not easy. But it will uh, it will reach its goal. So the the our people mostly like eighty percent around live outside of Armenia. Just imagine eighty percent of nation live outside, and 
The most of them, they are rich people, at least not poor, right? And only 20% lives in Armenia. And a couple of them just on the top of some government stuff, they can survive because of corruption system. And those 80%, there has no any rule, any tool to be involved to, uh, to make some changes in own country, right? It must be solved. They might, must have, a, how to say, right to be involved, right to be elected, right to make a decision in this, regarding his own country. So what can be your uh, direct and the major, major uh, messages to the diaspora, which is 80%, 80% of nation. So what can be your major messages to the diaspora to have influence, to force the influence, to force their right to their own country to make some changes, which is badly we need it. It's obviously, otherwise we will just disappear from the map. See, only there is one way uh, to do that, to support parties and forces in Armenia uh, that people in the diaspora agree with, that parties with their programs, they know the people, they know the experience of that people, they can discuss with the people in Armenia and in these parties, what are their approaches to these kinds? Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that the constitution must be changed because without changing, no diaspora can be elected in Armenia. Not a diaspora. I myself, I have two citizenship. I live in Armenia, but I cannot be elected because I hold also second citizenship. And many people out of Armenia, within Armenia, that way, uh, how you can uh, use that potential, big potential. Why uh, at the beginning of 20th century, uh, there was a big uh, struggle fighting for women to have the right to vote because the movement uh, were are fifty percent of the population in the country, in average, sometimes a little bit more. more. And without involvement of fifty percent of the country, you cannot have enough potential to develop uh, your country. You mentioned that eighty percent of Armenians living abroad. Okay, maybe not eighty percent. At least, uh, let's say. Uh, half of Armenian people live out of Armenia. Half of Armenians are in Russia. Half of Armenians in the U.S. There's a lot. Armenian, no. People with Armenian origin and Armenians are two different things. Okay. There are a lot of people of Armenian origin in the United States, in Russia, but they are not Armenians. Saying Armenian, I mean uh, people who are interested in Armenia. They want to do something. They eager and so on. Otherwise, that uh, let's say in Georgia, there is an Armenian family with family Demirchan. They are living, having their business, and they do not care about Armenia. What the difference? Is he Armenian or uh, Italian or uh, Irish? I, I mean, at least half of, uh, I mean, in Armenia, we have, let's say, two and a half million people. At least there are two and a half million Armenians abroad. They are living day by day with Armenia. They are involved in this Armenian life. As I am sure that many people are watching us and so, they live physically, they are out of Armenia, but mentally they are in Armenia. And how can we ignore them? Sir, them? This is very important part because this will double, at least double, maybe triple, our uh, possibilities of our country. It's very, it's very important. And also with that, we can encourage the other Armenians, as I mentioned, they are ignorant to life in Armenia, to become uh, more, let's say, Armenian. This is very important because when we'll have 
really a proud Armenia, a prosperous Armenia, a developed country. Many Armenians that, no, they do not consider themselves as Armenians, will be reborn as Armenians. It's the, 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 we have such examples all over the world that yeah, yeah. people living out of their countries when they see their countries, because you have to be proud of your origin. Otherwise, if you are not proud, why you want to be part of a country far away that your grandfathers uh, or grand grandfathers were? Born? Because we Armenians that uh, emigrated from Armenia, but uh, the, let's say traditional diaspora, it's already this third or fourth generation of Armenians that uh, their ancestors came from Armenia, mainly Western Armenia. These are very important issues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the current government never was a national government in our understanding national. I mean, Azgain, because national in English also means uh, some other state. They never used word Azgain. They just using Karakatsiner, Benakchutun, never. Uh, this shows their uh, attitude towards these issues. Some of them consider to being national is a backward understanding of something. But I lived in many countries, including in Western countries. Let's say uh, Canada, which has no ethnicity, and it's very, very pressed for Western and more democratic country. Even they are proud to find some Canadian uh, role or traces in, uh, in the world saying, you see, that famous actor in Hollywood is from Canada. The other one, a, a dancer, American dancer, who came from Cuba, first came to Canada and then emigrated to the US. I mean, even they are trying, that it's normal. Uh, th this is very important part for Armenians to be involved and to be proud. Uh... Uh, Mr. Propian, you emphasized the, the power of diaspora in terms of money. Okay, we are not have too much money. I mean, like a couple hundred millions. Okay, we can just collect and help. But I think the, the, the strongest part of diaspora, the value of diaspora is not the money. The professionals, where they study, they live, they approach a Western type of life, Western type of uh, behavior, even the government. When you not go everyone, to... not everyone. You can find but... in the United States people that are more pro-Stalin and pro-Putin. No, uh, you, you're talking about uh, the past generation. The young people, they are more educated, they are more wise. They can bring a lot of good stuff, uh, good uh, stuffs, and culture. Uh, exactly culture to, to Armenia to build the system which, which can be uh, like more useful, more productive. So this is the major value I think uh, of, I think of a diaspora. So I uh, agree with you, but for that we have to uh, have uh, big changes in Armenia. In Armenia. Without changes in Armenia, sure. all diaspora efforts will be First, useless. all ignored or useless. And the uh, question, uh, if any chance, uh, like your party, the group, uh, like Beve, will become a governor of Armenia, what kind of changes may, might be there regarding uh, the diaspora and the rights of diaspora and people to be involved in the politics in, in Armenia? On the social life, uh, in the government, What's, do you have any uh, like understanding what kind of changes you want to do that, there? Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot speak on behalf of all the group, but I will speak on, on my behalf. You see, I am for giving the diaspora the same rights to be elected 
and to elect. But meanwhile, they have to have the same obligations because the rights come with obligation. They cannot. What kind of obligation of citizen in Armenia has? We all pay taxes in Armenia. In average, it $1,000 per year. But this includes the taxes also from uh, business uh, uh, organizations. I mean, we have to calculate how much per person is the taxes each year, which I think will come maybe per year, let's say three, four hundred dollars. If they want to be part of that club, they have to pay for that because otherwise there will be uh, the situation that they will have the rights the same, but not the same obligation. And this also will give people living in diaspora to be more involved because I understand the psychology there. If they pay money, they would like to use that. Yeah, then, uh, it, it's almost then, the same when you pay for a club. You want to go there to use your the, uh, the right. possibilities you're using. This, this is this kind of more uh, possibilities. And this also will give, uh, you are right, this more Western approach in political life, economic life, and so on. Is this, uh, uh, I, I mean, the same obligation and the same right we have to calculate and some find uh, some kind of a formula for that. Okay, uh, it sounds good. Uh, Sofia, is there any any, any uh, question? Uh, maybe after a couple of questions, we will finish because already two and a half hours we're speaking. In, in general, I think we cover covered all uh, questions. If there are like special questions, welcome. Um, I would say, I think um, most of the questions that um, viewers had asked that we have already covered these topics and uh, already answered most of these questions. Um, the last question I had was regarding what you just um, brought up, Mr. Hakopian, about the army and youth in the diaspora. I think that that, I agree that that's a big resource and probably a very um, uh, bright um, prospects in the future for the youth um, in the diaspora. And I think, do you have any uh, recommendations or any steps that you recommend for young people to follow? I know as a student and I know many other young Armenians that are very eager to reconnect and be more involved in Armenia. And what, what kind of recommendations do you have for Armenian youth in the diaspora? Uh, the new technologies generally give uh, much more possibilities for Armenians, for diaspora that we used to have. Because now you see, uh, I am in Yerevan, you are in uh, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. Nashville, Tennessee, you are in New York. We can speak each other with each other in life and understand. Um, and I see the uh, uh, diaspora role mainly, as I told, as a bridge with their local communities, with their connections. I, I worked with diaspora in many countries uh, as ambassador, as Armenian diplomat, and I was successful in many cases because I used the connections of the people that were living there for, for their life, let's say, or even less. This is very important, which you cannot buy just for money because with lobbying. But the problem is that uh, the, the diaspora needs uh, very direct, uh, let's say, milestones for the policy to implement. I was discussing the issue with some Armenian lawyers in November uh, during the war, and 
what was the direction given by Armenian government to these lawyers, recognize Artsakh. And when I ask them, why? Why? What will give the recognition of Artsakh to Artsakh? Nothing. It even will create more problems. And we discussed over two hours. They agreed with me that I am right. That only solution is Artsakh must become part of Armenia. And this is why they agreed with me. But they said, okay, we received from consul, from ambassador, from Yerevan, such kind of direction we have to do. This is, we again are coming to the political leadership of the country. Because uh, when the commander, uh, the Navapet, the ship, commander of the ship, I don't know, uh, is ta yeah. has taken a wrong direction. How uh, you will try to support that uh, ship to go faster and faster, you never will reach the goal because the direction is taken the wrong one. The same with the country. First, again, we are coming to political power in the country. Who will reign in Armenia? What kind of are the ideas? We will see Armenia as a ordinary country than many are in the world, or a country of Armenians, or all Armenians, or it will be just uh, the country for people living there. These are very fundamental issues. How we'll utilize the possibilities of our Armenians living abroad. All these things are very important. Let's say, first, what step we know we need to speak more each, to each other and try to understand. If we'll be in power, we'll make several very important changes including some changes of uh, in tax code and so on, because uh, also for repatriation, they create problem. Or let's say for investment. Uh, I met two days ago an Armenian woman who repatriated to Armenia from a country uh, with huge possibilities to invest in the uh, power section, electrakanuchan artadruchan, to create electricity. And I was surprised that in Georgia, it's much easier to invest in that field uh, because there are less permissions, less bureaucracy than in Armenia. And this woman is uh, trying to get all these permissions already a year. It's very important field for us. Uh, ecologically clean power stations based on German uh, technology. And we have these problems. This is that we have to abolish all obstacles in the field of repatriation, also economic investment, because repatriation will give more effect if it will come with uh, more efficient uh, investments. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Papian. If possible, just briefly, uh, we have a question we uh, kind of skip, but it's regarding the Mantashov's grandsons. Is, uh, does he have any chance for a lawsuit in uh, European Court of Justice? Yes, uh, I wrote an article maybe seven years ago proposing that we have to take the same steps as Israel is doing. In Israel, there are special groups that uh, have, let's say, three party groups, the state, the lawyers, and the owner of the property. They sign a contract, an agreement with each other, uh, the state gives political support, lawyers legal support, 
and they are fighting for that property, piece of property that belong to that family. And 10 years ago, I don't know the data, but I know the 10 years because I met the lawyers. 10 years ago, they received from Eastern European countries $4 billion in total as compensation the property. The same can be done to Mantashov family because when Mantashov's grand, uh, child grandson came to Armenia during the opening ceremony of his grandfather's uh, statue in Yerevan, I told at that time it's better now to negotiate and to receive an attorney, power of attorney, and to act. By the way, in Israel, the main lawyer who is fighting for the Jewish property is Alexander Gambarian from uh, St. Petersburg. He's my friend. We met several times, and he's ready to do. He came twice to Armenia proposing his support, his experience, but unfortunately, just nice word, not more. And uh, we could easily sue uh, Azerbaijan because, as I told, because of their declaration that Soviet period was a period of occupation. And if it's an occupation, nothing can be legal, legitimate during the occupation period which means nationalization of oil fields by Azerbaijani government or Soviet government is illegal. And they have all these uh, papers, all deeds, properties, and so on, they can fight. At least we uh, can in this way, uh, if not gaining, let's say, uh, big money, at least we can create problems for our enemies, which is also important because uh, we, have two, yeah, yeah, we, have, we have two just uh, options to make our country uh, stronger and to make our enemies weaker, as they are doing against Armenia. Their policy of isolation is Armenia to make Armenia weaker. Yeah, it's possible with the Mantashov family, with many, many others, it's possible to do. But for that, we again, we need some kind of organization, some kind of uh, uh, money, at least for the first stage. Later, it will uh, work on with uh, that money that will come. Thank you very much, Mr. Rabian. Thank you very much, Sophie. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and for our uh, listeners, please write down your comments. Uh, we will go for your comments for next time. I hope uh, this is what was our first exper experiment uh, to do this uh, live question mm -hmm. and answer session. But I guess uh, we need it uh, to do more in the future. And according to question and comments uh, below, we will uh, go for that questions also for next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. You are welcome.